welcome everybody at the Institut Francais for the second episode of the French Passion series, starring tonight three exceptional characters. First of all, Alain de Botton, extraordinary writer and essayist, whose book Proust, How Proust Can Change Your Life, changed mine actually, being a chef d'oeuvre of our time. I can tell you that uh, for the first time, Alain. Starring then Henri Bell, the Stendhal, who, whose ambition, as you probably know, was to write for the happy few. And here we are. <laughs> Starring Boyd Tonkin, the literary editor of The Independent. I want to thank you both. Boyd accepted so kindly to chair the whole series. Thank you so much. And I want to thank Arnaud because he most gratefully said yes when I got in touch with him about the project, not being afraid of these crazy French people yelling at each other about literature. You heard that before. Now, I hope I'll see you all for the third episode, episode of French Passions with Posey Simmons, Flaubert, and Boyd Tonkin in March. And meanwhile, have the most beautiful evening with our guests. Thank you. This evening, I'm really delighted that uh, we have uh, Alain de Botton with us uh, to talk about Stendhal. Um, Hélène uh, touched on some of his achievements, uh, and uh, I just want very briefly to uh, mention some more of them. Uh, Alain actually started out as a novelist uh, with uh, books such as um, Essays in Love and the Romantic Movement. Uh, and then came the shift to the form of a totally accessible philosophical essay, which has actually won him so many fans and admirers, both in this country and in uh, many other places too. There was uh, How Proust Can Change Your Life, uh, The Consolations of Philosophy, The Art of Travel, Status Anxiety, The Architecture of Happiness, um, the pleasures and sorrows of work. And um, I would also like to mention that uh, last year, uh, Alain had the um, questionable privilege of being writer in residence at Heathrow Airport. Uh, this uh, created a, a delightful little book called A Week at the Airport. And uh, the next time you are delayed in that very location, as you no doubt will be, I can think of no better way of passing the time. Um, well, we have a, a perfect uh, mixture of uh, subject uh, and uh, presenter in that uh, Stendhal, of course, is a, a great uh, illuminator of the everyday. Um, I'm often slightly worried when people d describe Alain as a popular philosopher uh, because uh, although, of course, he draws on the great thinkers and writers of the past, he also pays uh, incredibly close attention to the textures of our everyday lives uh, in order to draw out the, the lessons, the meanings uh, behind them, uh, in order that we can live them uh, with slightly more uh, joy and understanding. And in a way, this is uh, certainly from my point of view, a very close match with the, the mission uh, uh, set himself by the man who called himself Stendhal, although I think it, over his lifetime he, ha he had about 200 different aliases. So for the purposes of simplicity, he should probably remain Stendhal. Um, well, Alain is going to read and talk briefly. Uh, then we will talk. Uh, then I will hope, I hope that you'll be able to contribute uh, questions and comments. And at the end, uh, Alain will be available to, to sign books uh, just uh, downstairs. So. Not Stendhal. Yes. Um, thank you so much, Boyd, and thank you to the uh, the French Institute, and to all of you for, um, for coming. Um, Stendhal is, is one of those writers, and there are not very many for me, but one of those writers who first alerted me to the possibility that I might become a writer. Because I think most writers really begin with the thought of, of picking somebody, and that somebody opens doors and shows them possibilities. And for me, this was Stendhal. The way that he wrote um, allowed me to start becoming a writer. And I have... Um, his book on love by my bookshelf 
at all times, very close by. He gives me inspiration. He gives me courage. Um, I'm going to be doing something fairly unusual here tonight. And um, any of you who are offended, please uh, leave now. And I'm so sorry. Um, I'm not going to talk about Stendhal's <coughs> novels. Now, sorry. Um, of course, Stendhal is mostly known as a novelist. He's mostly known as the author of The Red and the Black and The Charter House of Palmer. These are the two great achievements um, in the, the world of fiction. For me, and for some others, the happy few, Stendhal is um, also to be remembered for his nonfiction, particularly his book On Love and his many works of autobiography and travel writing, uh, his essays on art and on music, uh, and many other diverse uh, bits of writing, some of which are are quite hard to find, but when one does find them, one tends to discover the same sorts of themes, a very personal, intimate voice combined with uh, a kind of rigorous, almost clinical language. One feels, well, I always remember Lytton Strachey's description of Stendhal as a man who combined the emotionalism of a 12-year-old girl with the rigor of a high court judge. Um, and I love that mixture in him, and um, I think for anyone who has got a 12-year-old girl inside them, as I do. Um, Stendhal is a terribly appealing sort of uh, uh, writer. He's always, I mean, anyway, I, I, what I thought I would do now is just sort of dip into a few, a few passages to give you the flavor and to give you the sense of what I think is remarkable uh, ab about him. He's an inveterate maker of lists, Stendhal. And he also um, peppers his autobiographical writings with drawings. He will draw a sketch of the position of his hand and the position of his lover's hand uh, at a particular moment. Uh, he'll draw a, 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 a map of a journey between Rome and Florence, describing at each point where an idea happened to occur to him. So there's a desire, very strong desire in him, which I recognize in myself, to pin down, taxonomize, uh, create out of the messy turbulence of life a kind of encyclopedia. And I think what's interesting in Stendhal is that from the first, you know it's not really going to work. The emotions are always probably going to get the upper hand, but it's that resolute attempt which is so fascinating. Um, here's a little quote from uh, The Life of Henri Brulard, one of his many autobiographical uh, attempts. The other day, musing on life on the lonely road above Lake, Alban Lake Albano, I decided that my life could be summed up in these names who in, whose initial letters I wrote in the dust with my stick, sitting on the little seat behind the Stations of the Cross, near those two beautiful trees enclosed by a circular wall, Virginie, Angela, Adèle, Mélanie, Mina, Alexandrine, Angeline, Angela, Mathilde, Clémentine, Julia. So that's his life. And he was a great romantic who was extremely unsuccessful with love, if we associate success with love as um, conquest in the bedroom uh, and a happy marriage with many children. This did not happen to Stendhal. Um, nevertheless, uh, love worked for him. He, it created, it led to his great masterpieces, his mishaps in love in that classic um, sort of sublimation um, of which um, writers can on a good day um, that process of information which, which writers can perform, it, it did work for him. Um, Stendhal had a very, th there's a sort of moral geography to Stendhal. There are lots of things that are good and bad in Stendhal's worldview, and they're quite well defined. And it, when one's discussing him, it's quite good to get a sense of what those things are. The first thing that's really bad is France. France is terrible. The French are awful, and in particular, the Parisians are awful. Uh, the French are awful because they have no passion. They are cold. They let their vanity overtake them. They uh, are always worried about what other people think of them, and they don't follow their own hearts. Um, the opposition to France is Italy. Italians are everything that the French are not. They are passionate. Um, they are, um, in a way, primitive. He calls them primitive, but it's a good kind of primitiveness in, uh, in, in Stendhal's uh, uh, view. And other nations around the world tend to fall into either the Italian camp or the, uh, or the French camp in, in, in different sorts of ways. Um, start, uh, let me, let me, he's, he's got some wonderful stereotypes. In, in his book on love, um, he runs through different nations in love and sort of almost awards them marks according to uh, how well they perform. And really, by, by, by what he means by that, by performance is 
how much of a capacity they have to make fools of themselves in the name of love and to suffer for love. That's what he thinks love should do. If we really are proper lovers, we allow ourselves to be humiliated by the power of love. And that's what he blames the French for. The French are not able to make themselves ridiculous in love. But he looks back in France. This is his consideration of love in France. He says, in the Middle Ages in France, men's hearts were infused with an ever-present sense of danger. And here, if I'm not mistaken, lies the main reason for the astonishing superiority of the men of the 16th century. Originality, nowadays so rare, ridiculous, dangerous, and often affected, was then general and unvarnished. Great men are still born in countries like Corsica, Spain, and Italy, where danger still shows its iron hand often. In climates where burning summer, summers heat the bile for three months of the year, it's only the direction of drive that is lacking. In Paris, I'm very much afraid, it's the drive itself. And then he adds in a footnote, the fact is that anyone who goes out of doors in Corsica risks being shot at. And the Corsican, instead of submitting to this as a true Christian should, endeavors to defend and above all to revenge himself. That is how personality, personalities of Napoleon's caliber are made. The other key thing to understand when reading Stendhal is that he was a supporter of Napoleon. Napoleon stood for a different sort of France, a passionate France. After Napoleon's defeat, um, Stendhal sees the resurgence of all that he hates most in, in France, the bourgeois order. And in this sense, he's typical of a 19th century French writer, someone who rails against the bourgeoisie, though himself he is a bourgeois, but he's very ambivalently placed uh, uh, towards it. And he, he detests the politeness, the neatness, the order of 19th century uh, uh, France. He says, um, a perfect civilization would unite the delicate pleasures of the 19th century with a more frequent presence of danger. The pleasures of private life ought to be augmented to an infinite degree by recurrent exposure to danger. I'm not talking simply of military danger. I should prefer perpetual danger of every kind, threatening every interest in life, which was the essence of the life of the Middle Ages. And he goes, he, he, he is a great reader of history. He's always... He's very moralistic in his reading of history. He's not after the facts. He's, he's after, he wants to twist all of world history through his, um, through his optics. I admire the way lived in the time, I admire the way that people lived in the time of Louis XIV. They were constantly, constantly leaving the salons of Marly and reaching the battlefields of Senef and Ramilly within three days. Wives, mothers, and mistresses were continually on tenterhooks. See Madame de Sévigné's letters. The presence of danger kept an energy and a frankness in the language, which nowadays we should not dare to risk. So, in other words, he, he's, he's appalled by the lack of a sense of uh, danger. England, unfortunately, falls under the category of France in being a very passionless uh, sort of place. He's got wonderfully caustic things to say. In England, the rich, bored with their homes and on the plea of necessary exercise, walk four or five leagues every day as though man were created and placed on earth for the purpose of trotting. In this way, they use up their nervous fluid through the legs instead of through the heart, after which they make so bold as to talk of feminine delicacy and to despise Spain and Italy. And he admires the fact that in Spain and Italy, people never go for walks. And the reason they don't go for walks is they're so passionate. They are so all the time in, in a sort of frenzy of, uh, of passion. He does have a few generous words to say for, for Scotland. Um, He's, he likes the inner melancholy of Scottish women uh, that he's observed in, uh, in, in, in Edinburgh. And, uh, and also he likes the fact there was a bit of danger in Scotland, but more recently than in, uh, than in England. But the country, oddly, as I'm Swiss, the country that he really loves most is Switzerland, which, as a good Rousseauist, uh, he's a bit suspicious of Rousseau, but he essentially buys into Rousseau's argument that Switzerland is, is great. And the reason is that um, Swiss people live very passionately. They have no self-consciousness, particularly in relation to, uh, to love. He writes, a highly respected colonel was once obliged in the course of a mountain journey near Bern to spend the night deep in one of the most secluded and picturesque valleys in that part of the world. He stayed at the house of a senior magistrate of the valley, a wealthy and respectable man. As he entered, the traveler noticed a girl of 16, a model of grace, freshness, and simplicity. She was the daughter of the house. That night there was a dance, and the traveler set his cap at the girl, who really was strikingly beautiful. Finally, he summoned up the courage to ask if he might spend the night with her. No, she replied, because of my cousin. She sleeps beside me, but, but I will come to you. 
One may well imagine the agitation this answer aroused. After supper, the traveller rose and went to his room, followed by the girl carrying a torch. He thought happiness was awaiting him. No, no, not yet, she said simply. First, I must ask my mother's permission. He could hardly have been more staggered by a thunderbolt. She left the room, and plucking up courage, he tiptoed up to the thin wooden wall of the good people's living room, in time to hear the daughter asking her mother in caressing tones for the desired permission, which at last she obtained. What do you say, father, said the mother to her husband, who was already in bed. You're agreeable to Trinelli spending the night with a colonel, aren't you? With all my heart, was the reply, I think I'd lend my wife herself to such a man. <laughs> off you go then, said the mother to Trinelli, but be a good girl and don't take off your skirt. At daybreak, Trinelli, respected by the traveller and still a virgin, rose and arranged the pillows of the bed. She prepared coffee and cream for her companion, and having breakfasted with him, sitting on the bed, she cut off a tiny piece from her brustplets, a velvet cloth covering her bosom. Take this, she said, and keep it in memory of a happy night. For my part, I shall never forget it. So that's love, as Stodal <laughs> thinks it should happen in, in Switzerland. But back in France, it's a much, much more torturous affair, full of fiascos. He devotes a whole two chapters to a phenomenon he knows as fiascos, which is essentially occasions of impotence. And along with Montaigne, he's one of the first, and perhaps only, French writers to make quite a big deal of this. Um, he, he gives a wonderful sort of, you know, quotes about how his life and his, um, his social life goes. Tonight at General Michaud's headquarters, we were discussing fiascos, five handsome young fellows of 25 and myself. It appeared that with the exception of one popinjay, who was probably lying, we had all suffered a fiasco on our first occasion with our most notable mistresses. Admittedly, perhaps none of us had ever known what Delphante calls passionate love. The idea that a fiasco is a very common misfortune should decrease the risk of its occurrence. And in a sense, that's what he wants his whole book to do. He wants his book to be a place where unhappy lovers can congregate and can realize not just that fiascos may occur, but that all kinds of difficulties may occur. And uh, that's what's so particularly tender about Stendhal. He has this sort of therapeutic vision of literature. It's a place where the sad, happy few can gather and remember just how difficult it is uh, to be happy. <laughs> Thank you, Ella. Um, well, I'm still reeling at the vision of Switzerland as the, <laughs> the world's most passionate and, and unbridled, unbuttoned country. Um, but uh, I wanted to ask, first of all, how and where and when did you fall in love with Stondal? Did it creep up on you slowly, or was it a coup de foudre? Well, um, when I first heard Sandal's name, I immediately thought, well, I've got to go and read the novels, and I just couldn't get on with them. I found The Red and the Black just artificial and cold, and I just, still to this day, it doesn't work for me. And I'm aware that it's a deficiency in myself, but there we are. And so I thought, well, Sandal's not going to be for me, until one day I came across a copy of De L'Amour on love, and um, I must have been about 20 at the time, and it was a complete revelation. I thought, here's this man writing as the best French writers write, and for me the best French writers are people like Baudelaire, Flaubert, Montaigne, um, people who write from the heart in, a, in that particularly intimate way without cynicism. Um, the thing that I've always been mistrustful of in English literature is it's the overwhelming presence of cynicism and, and um, a kind of humorous distancing, as though this doesn't quite happen to us. What I love about French writers is they put themselves on the line. And you get that, as I say, in all these people. And particularly in someone like Stendhal. Here is this man telling us, I've been unhappy in love. I've suffered. Um, uh, you know, I've thought all night about someone's hand, this woman's hand. And you know, I was 20 and um, falling in love with a lot of hands and um, not getting very far. And I just thought, you know, this is wonderful. Um, this is the sort of man I want to know. And um, you know, I always remember that wonderful description um, in uh, The Catcher in the Rye, where Holden Caulfield said the idea of a good writer is someone that you want to call up on the telephone and have a yes. chat with. And um, you know, that for me was, was Stendhal at that time. Uh, so someone who was speaking to you, and speaking to you precisely because of this intimacy and frankness, and an, up, what, an absence of masks, an absence of pretense? Yes, absolutely. Um, 
a kind of sincerity, um, and at the same time, a formality. Um, it's that tension between the formality and the sincerity which is interesting. And you know, one thing I loved about On Love is that it's, it's, it's written in the form of a quite cold, almost sort of physiological, psychological treatise on love. So it looks from a distance um, as though you're, you're going to get you know, uh, quite a sort of barren account. So there are chapter headings called things like concerning the birth of love and you know, concerning hope. But then it gets, the chapter headings get in a way quite silly or um, they, they, they start to veer off. He, he, he doesn't quite keep to his subject. There's an entire chapter, chapter nine. So we've had you know, chapter eight, which is all about, uh, um, yes, the, the, the topic of crystallization of love. And then suddenly there's chapter nine, and it's only three lines long. I'll read you chapter nine. I'm trying extremely hard to be dry. My heart thinks it has so much to say, but I try to keep it quiet. I'm continually beset by the fear that I may have expressed only a sigh when I thought I was stating a truth. So that's the end of chapter nine. So he's playing with the form yeah. of the Cole so sociological treatise. Yeah. And I like that sort of, I mean, way before postmodernism came on the scene, he's taking a genre and he's subverting it. But, but could, could we uh, return to uh, your initial point about your resistance to um, Stondhal's fiction? Would it not in some lights be possible to see uh, On Love as an autobiographical novel? Absolutely. And in fact, he, he describes it as a novel. And... Um, and, and absolutely, it is, it is a novel. And, um, and um, I mean, w w what I think he does very well is that he mixes analysis with color. So he'll have a chapter you know, concerning hope. And half of it is quite a sort of technical psychological description. And then he'll say, uh, and the other night I was with Mrs. X, and I was discussing this, and she'd had a famous affair with Colonel Y. And um, you know, and suddenly you're in, you know, in the salon. You're you're you're, you're picturing a scene, and then you're yeah. back to analysis. So well, I, could it be that what he's doing is, is writing a form of fiction, if you want to call call it fiction, that that, that actually didn't exist in his time? <coughs> Absolutely. So he he's almost um, leaping into the future to a period when this kind of autofiction, or whatever you want to call it, would have a, a recognized place within the genres. Yes, absolutely. And um, I, mean, I think what's interesting is that Stardal is so, he appears in every history of literature as the pioneer of the novel, the, you know, the 19th century realistic novel. What he doesn't, he isn't really credited for is for the, as you suggest, the technical achievement that is on love. Um, that it's not just, you know, a, 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 another description of, 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 you know, love poem or something. It's a very original form. And I think that few writers have picked up on it. Um, I mean, I've explicitly picked up on it. My first book, Essays in Love, was explicitly modeled on uh, on love, um, but I, I, you know, a, a novelist like Milan Kundera, I don't. He doesn't talk about uh, on love, but um, you can see a similar desire for chapters, short chapters, that mixture of psychological analysis and texture and color. Um, you know, I wonder whether he, whether that book is close to him. He, he, he never refers to it. That, that's very interesting because, of course, it, we, we talked about the sincerity of Stendhal, but, but there is also, of course, this enormous <coughs> level of artifice. Mm. But what is being created is a persona, a voice, and a series of adventures for, for this voice to, 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 uh, to go through. Um, which is just as literary as, as any of his formal fictions. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think but I think what, what stops this game, what stops the, 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 the pseudonyms and the names, etc., from seeming like mere games is that you feel the reason why he's doing it is um, that it's so overwhelming for him, these emotions, that he's forced to get a bit of distance. So it's, it's that classic novelistic maneuver when instead of putting an experience into your own mouth, you say, you know, there was a character of a certain age who was walking down the street, and it's obviously the author. The reason you're doing that is not. Uh, to lie, not to make it, you know, not to protect your family or whatever it is, but it's basically because the emotion is so intense, you need that little bit of objectivity, but it comes from an excess of feeling rather than a deficiency. Yes, yeah. So it would be wrong, therefore, wouldn't it, to, to treat on love as some kind of treatise telling people how to be in love, how to manage their affairs, uh, um, a how-to manual for, for Valentine's Day or whatever. Yes, that's it's, right. Or, yes. or, or if it is, it, I mean, the, the, the classic error of manuals is that they suggest that the way to cheer people up, the way to give people guidance is to give them answers. And the wonderful thing about On Love is that it merely complicates the situation. And um, 
it, it, it achieves its consoling effect, because I think it does have a consoling effect, by reminding all unhappy lovers that they're not alone. Um, and, you know, there's a wonderful, let me read you in his, in, in his introduction, he, he writes a preface for the sort of person who he wants to read his book, you know, it's explicitly written for a certain kind of unhappy lover. Though I've made every effort, but he, he recognizes that it's not for everyone. Though I've made every effort to be clear and lucid, I cannot work miracles. I cannot give hearing to the deaf nor sight to the blind. So people with money and coarse pursuits, who've made 100,000 francs in the year before they opened this book, had better close it again quickly, particularly if they are bankers, manufacturers, <laughs> or respectable industrialists. In a word, men with highly positive ideas. The book will be less unintelligible to anyone who has won a fortune on the stock exchange or in a lottery. It's a classic sort of romantic versus sort of bourgeois opposition. Wealth won in such a way is compatible with the habit of daydreaming for hours at a time or of enjoying the emotions stirred by one of Proudhon's pictures, by a passage of Mozart, or by a certain glance of a woman who is often in your thoughts. People who pay 2,000 workmen at the end of every week do not waste their time like this. Their minds are always bent on useful and positive things. Interesting, he's very rude about Americans um, because he sees America as the fountain of a kind of positive thinking. So he's not at all into positive thinking. Uh, had he ever met an American, or is, is this simply an idea which had already taken root in, in Napoleonic France? Uh, I, th I think like, the latter, yes, the yes, latter. But, yes, he, but he 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 was already picking up on something which de Tocqueville would of course pick up on. In, in democracy in America. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Very soon after, yes, which is yes. that. Um, uh, in his view, love cannot flourish in America because um, people are too practical and too interested in being happy. Yeah. And, and for yeah. Stendhal, the typical romantic yeah. Yeah. miserabilist, he very much yes. associates the experience yeah. of true love with, with, with difficulty. Yeah, so, 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 I mean, we mentioned the famous chapter on uh, fiascos, which is uh, my favorite euphemism, I think. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, so is it the case that, that, that uh, uh, there's that famous quotation, much abused by Montelon, when he said that happiness writes white. Um, that uh, is it the case that, that uh, a happy Stendhal would not have been able to write as he did? That, that there has to be an experience of frustration, of disappointment, of distance from the beloved. Yes, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure that's right. Although, you know, my view on this topic, and it comes up with lots of these sort of poète maudits that France produces quite regularly, Baudelaire, etc., Verlaine, etc., um, that, that essentially most of our lives have enormous challenges. We're un all of us unhappy for quite a lot of the time, but not all of us manage to do a Stendhal. So it's not so much, you know, if he'd been happy, he wouldn't have written. What, what's really amazing is that, like all of us, he was quite unhappy for lots of the time, and he managed to pull this off. Um, and he did so, I mean, his... His, his psychobiography is interesting. I mean, what, what's, what's fascinating and very touching is he was obsessed with his mother. His mother died when he was seven. And this was the great love of his life. And he's, I mean, there's an there's a extraordinary bit. If there are any psychoanalysts in the room, I mean, I'll just read it very quickly. He describes his mother, his feelings for his mother. Um, my mother, Madame Henriette Gagnon, was a charming woman, and I was in love with my mother. I hasten to add that I lost her when I was seven years old. In loving her at the age of six, perhaps in 1789, I had absolutely the same character as in 1828, when I was furiously in love with Albert de Rubempré. My manner of going in pursuit of happiness had not changed at all in essence, with this one exception, that where the physics of love is concerned, I was like Caesar, would be would be were he to return to a world employing cannon and small arms. I would soon have learnt it, and it would have changed nothing fundamentally in my tactics. I wanted to cover my mother in kisses, and for there not to be any clothes. She loved me passionately and kissed me often. I returned her kisses with such ardour that she was compelled to move away. I loathed my father when he came and interrupted our kissing. I always wanted to give her them on her bosom. Kindly condescend to remember that I lost her in childbirth, when I was scarcely seven years old. The other interesting thing is, like Proust, he was another great French writer who very much loved his mother. And there's a lot of this. There's a lot of close motherness in French literature. Uh, I, I, as, you, as you were saying that, I was remembering um, Roland Barthes. Um, uh, uh, a lover's discourse. Yep. Someone else with exactly the same relationship with, uh, with his mother. Absolutely. Yes. And I think yes. that that is... 
something absolutely key to French literature. The fact that, fr and, and because it really reflects on uh, French emotional life. In France, you can love your mother very dearly. And relations between sons, but also daughters and their mothers can be very close. There's an admitted closeness. In England, uh, after a certain age, you push mother away. Um, and I think that if you're a writer, that's a problem. Because pushing mother away in the symbolic sense is the route to a certain kind of distancing and irony. And, you know, could we imagine, and, you know, bless him, and he's a great writer in many ways, Martin Amis writing about maman, mummy, as Proust does? No, he, he doesn't. And I think he should. Um, maybe he will. Um, but, but I think it's, you know, I think it's, um, it's something that French writers know how to do because French society has room for that. And as you say, Roland Barthes is another very touching example, and, and um, it's, it's touching, and it's the, the root of a lot of their emotion. Now, uh, obviously, one could approach a passage like that and, and treat it as sort of Freud for beginners. Mm. But is there a sense that the, 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 the perfect, the ideal having been lost, then every subsequent affair has to be doomed to disaster, to fiasco at some point? Yes, absolutely. And... Um, you know, if one could have got Stendhal to the couch, um, one would have said to him something like, um, you know, what you loved in your mother exists in other women, and your mother was not perfect. And if you had grown up to live with her, you would have realized that she was, at the end of the day, just another human being, that you happened to love her. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it to the couch. And, um, and, and, and we have some books to, to thank. Um, uh, we get those in exchange. But yes, I mean, like Proust, and uh, like, like many French writers, like many, like many people in life, um, he idealized women. And um, that creates an interesting um, sort of dynamic. On the one hand, he's, he's very good at understanding women. He, he, he's very in touch with his feminine side. He knows that he identifies with women. But at the same time, um, he can't get too close to them. There's a problem whenever he gets too close to them because you know, of this mother image um, that he's protecting at some level. So, yeah, all sorts of problems there. Yeah, but, but uh, I mean, he has be, been, uh, as I recall, he was praised by Simone de Beauvoir, uh, yeah. for instance, uh, for his empathy with, with, with women, which kind of creates a curious paradox, because in, in one sense, the, the objects of his desire are fantasies that can never, as you say, live up to, to, to mm. the perfect ideal that, 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 has, been, that has died. Mm. Uh, but on the other, they are realized, they are acknowledged for, for who they are. Absolutely. Yes, I mean, the interesting thing, his mother was um, not particularly educated. She was, you know, at some point he describes as sort of a country woman, um, but was very spontaneous and in, obviously intelligent. And he he always remembered that about his mother, and it gives him a taste for women who are spirited, not necessarily intellectual. He doesn't like, you know, Moliere's overeducated uh, 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 women. He wants a kind of natural intelligence, and he thinks that what's gone wrong with women's education is that most women are not educated at all, and then a narrow elite become over intellectualized. So he was extremely keen on. Um, women having the same education as boys, uh, girls having the same education as boys. He was very close to his sister, Pauline. Um, very touching letters between brother and sister all through their teens and 20s. And um, you, you, you get a sense of somebody who uh, was really a friend to women. So it, it doesn't surprise me that uh, de Beauvoir recognized that, that in him. And what about the more formal or analytic parts of Onmar? When, for instance, he's talking about crystallization, which has given right to, rise to a lot of very boring criticism. Mm. Um, um, I, I mean, is he blinding us with science? Do, does it matter whether or not we follow each stage of, of this pseudo scientific metaphor? Or is it all just part of the performance? I'm, I'm glad that you're hinting at what I certainly feel, which is that it is a performance. And literary critics often take it very seriously. Because at various points, he says, you know, there are seven stages of love or three stages of seduction or, you know, 16 types of glances. And normally he'll start enumerating them and give up halfway through. And literary critics have yeah. poured over this and have tried to recreate and have said, well, even though Stendhal was missing, you know, glance number 10, um, we can infer from a passage in Origin One that he must have meant this. And they're trying to recreate it. And really, he doesn't care at all. As you say it's a performance. Yes. He's satirizing, in a sense, um, 
that side of all of our minds, which tries to make lists with stuff from which you can't make lists. Um, yeah, so is there, uh, therefore, uh, uh, obviously we, we've talked about Stondahl as the, the romantic, the, the, the subjectivist, which is evident on every page. But also there, there is the sense that he is a child of his time. He's a Mabar of the Enlightenment. He thinks, he, in, in theory, he thinks things should be analyzed, broken down into their component parts and displayed in, in neat lists and diagrams. But, but um, part of the comedy of his nonfiction writing is that he knows he'll never get there. Yes. Absolutely, and he's, there's such a tension because, you know, that little passage I read out, he, he appreciates the comforts of the 19th century, but at the same time, he wants some guns to be going off, yes. and you know, he wants a little bit of Corsican danger, um, and, it, and that's why his ideal is a sort of, you know, he wants, you know, he wants passion, but he's not quite willing to take on everything that passion really demands, and in this sense, he's like Flaubert who is passionately interested in you know, drama and hates the bourgeoisie, but lives like a bourgeois and only allows himself brief forays into this other side of life. So he's, he's ambivalent, but I think this ambivalence is very natural. And it's, it's probably all of our ambivalence. I mean, all of us in this room probably are, are a mixture of leading quite neat bourgeois lives and sensible lives and we'll be up at an early hour tomorrow, etc. And at the same time, wouldn't mind the odd gun going off and an adventure in Corsica yes, yes. Or, or a trip up to Switzerland to that <laughs> yes, valley. To, to, um, yes, exotic <laughs> so, Switzerland. Exotic yes, Switzerland. Yes, um, yes. And um, Swiss tourist board will be inundated with requests yes, yes. tomorrow. Um, and, 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 it, and it's precisely that tension. That tension yes. is, is our tension nowadays. Yes, but uh, he's yes. perhaps through, you know, that's the great thing about going back in time. Going back in time, you often see dilemmas which are our own more starkly expressed. We are exactly what Stendhal was. We're, we're, we are both uh, you know, the children of the Enlightenment, rationalists, into bourgeois accumulation, commerce, etc. And on the other hand, we're the heirs of um, you know, religious intoxication that's been secularized as romantic intoxication. And, and we long for drama and excitement. Yes. Um, and it's, those forces are permanently in balance, and, and they're so in balance in Stendhal all the time. We, we, we talked a lot uh, uh, about Stendhal, in a way, being ahead of his time, or at least being able to speak to us very, very directly about the kind <coughs> of dilemmas uh, uh, and doubts that we have. Um, I want to ask you uh, uh, the same question I asked Will two weeks ago, which is, is there ever a moment or passages when you're reading Stendhal where you feel actually distant from him, where you feel this is the very much the emotional world of the, the 1820s, not of the 21st century, and that there is a gulf there which no amount of sympathy is going to overcome? Yes, I'm sure there is. Um, I mean, his life's a bit weird. You know, he keeps going to operas and balls and salons, and a lot of his time is spent in drawing rooms. And, and that sort of life is, is quite foreign to, to all of us now, I think. Um, he also, his responses to music are of a kind that, I mean, they're, they're very, very important to him, music. You know, he will, he will travel from Paris to Milan to hear Rossini or, or whatever. He, he, will, he will hear, he, music is incredibly important. Nowadays, because we can hear music whenever we like, it's very hard to imagine what that must have meant to arrive at La Scala and you know, to only hear a piece of music once or you know, hear a piece of Mozart played. You know, th th these were life-defining moments and he would remember when he happened to hear a certain piece of music playing. And I think we've lost that. Um, we simply, you know, music is too widely. Uh, uh, that, that is our loss in a way in that he has a, an intensity and immediacy yeah. of response that, that we can't really emulate. Now. Yeah, yes. Um, I mean, is there something else that Yes, I don't know. Um, I, I mean, uh, for instance, the, the, uh, in a way we've sidestepped this by not talking about the fiction, but, mm. but the, the concern with the institutional politics of France and Europe, yeah. which, which of course yeah. was something that did preoccupy him a lot and can appear fairly remote to us. <laughs> yes, I mean, absolutely. The whole background of the church, uh, the Napoleonic uh, era, uh, the Restoration, um, all of these things we know as, as, as history. But of course, one of the charms of reading Stendhal is that you, you, you get them as, as fiction and, and as life, that you realize that, um, you know, for Stendhal, the fall of Napoleon was not an abstract historical event. He lost his job, uh, and the whole of his life, the texture of his life changed. Um, and it was back to the world of 
um, the narrow, mean-spirited bourgeois world that he'd known in his childhood, whereas Napoleon, you know, he went with Napoleon to Russia, uh, and you know, for him, it was an adventure. He was a, a young man having fun, um, and uh, you know, it's it's very interesting to see how that historical event was filtered through this one man experience. I think we should talk a little about uh, um, Stendhal as a traveller because yeah. it's such a, an important part of his work. And another thing that, that ties him to our experience in ambiguous ways. Uh, uh, are there particular qualities of his tra travel writing that you enjoy, having written about the genre yourself and traced its history? Um, I think what's great is that he's never boring when he travels. He sketches things very quickly and he makes great judgments, but he does so in a spirit. I mean, nowadays he would be accused of making generalizations. Some people would be offended, but he will tell you, you know, people from Andalusia are like this, English people are like that, and he's constantly changing his views. But he's, but he's sort of, and, he, and he's also very, very specific in his kind of um, assessment of things, so that he'll, he, he very quickly, you know, you're zoomed into uh, a, a, a place. Um, let me try and give you a sense, uh, I mean, yeah, when, you know, when he goes to England, um, he's, um, he's automatically... The besetting sin of English society, which daily gives rise to more unhappiness than does debt and its consequences, more even than the deadly war of the rich against the poor, may be exemplified by something I was told this autumn in Croydon, in front of the fine statue of the bishop. No man here wants to press forward in case he should be disappointed in the attempt. Um, this, this is sexually. So he blames England for being a country where sort of no one dares to make a move. Um, and, and, you know, and, and that, it's that sort of detail. He's in Croydon. He's, someone tells him something. Um, it's that sort of local colour. It's that you know, vivid little sketch that makes him such an appealing travel writer. Yes. And, uh, of course, uh, as you mentioned, his great ideal of the, the perfect place is Italy. Um, and, uh, of course, he, 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 as I recall, when he went to Italy, he was uh, um, not just excited, but sort of overwhelmed. Uh, uh, and there is this idea of the Stondal syndrome of, of the, the traveller who is so flabbergasted by the excitement of, of um, discovery and sightseeing that, that it becomes almost a, a, a syndrome, a, a problem. Um, yes. Now, do, 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 do you think that that's real, or is it another part of the Stendhalian performance? It, it, it is. It is. I mean, one shouldn't read Stendhal for you know a reliable guidebook to the charms of Italy. You know, there are, there are better books um, for that. What one reads him for is a description of how one can use a country internally, not that one wants to get everything about a country right, but that one can identify in the country um, things that one needs internally and then build them up and make sure one finds them in, an, in another country. So a country becomes a resource, an internal resource. And what's nice is that Sandal doesn't care that he's getting Italy right. Um, you know, it's one of the most sort of banal demands that we make of modern travel writing, that countries, that people should get things right. I mean, the reason why a lot of modern travel writing is boring is that people are not allowed to invent countries as they see them and as they want them to be. Whereas, you know, if you read someone like Flaubert's descriptions of Egypt, Egypt is a made-up country for Flaubert. Not that it bears no relationship to the Egypt of his day, but that essentially what he's doing is he's locating in Egypt things that he needs internally. And Stendhal is doing exactly the same with Italy. Uh, it's a sort of land of his kind of dreams. And, and so be it. I mean, why is that a problem? Uh, uh, um but of course he lived there, so in a, in a way he had to negotiate the distance between the the the, um, uh, the internal utopia and the uh, the the external place where he actually had to work as a consul in Trieste and Civitavecchia and so forth. But he never quite lost the idealism, did he? No, no. I mean, it, it was genuinely sincere, and and what he loved about Italy was that. Um, he loved Italians' commitment to their freedom from the Austrians at that time. <coughs> he loved um, the, the sincerity, the, he loved the passion. He loved the balance between the restraint of the society and nevertheless the lack of coquettishness, um, both in men and women. What he hated about France was uh, the kind of the, um, 
the use of love for other ends, vanity love, he called it, um, love to try and make oneself seem intelligent or um, using the discourse of love to, for financial gain or whatever. He saw in Italy that love was used um, simply for its own sake and that people lost things because of love, that people would risk things. So On, on Love is full of little sketches of Italians who've, um, you know, lost their lives because of love or been shut up in a convent and um, you know never seen the light of day again because of an unhappy love affair he admires the wreckage that love can can perform on people's lives and he thinks that Italians um, allow that to happen to them and in that sense he thinks that they are sincere if you go to Italy today to, to take the most obvious example is there any connection between this this romantic vision and uh, contemporary reality, or is that simply not the point? Well, this is a That's very this this was a very live question for me, aged about twenty, when I'd read Stendhal and then thought, where shall I go on holiday? And thought, yes, well, yes, Italy yes, might yes, be a good yes, idea, imagining yes. that some of these characters that had so yes, haunted yes, Stendhal, yes. and they tend to be proud, uh, melancholic. Uh, severe, lonely women, uh, often already in relationships, very on their own, uh, very sort of isolated figures. Anyway, so I was very keen as I got off the station in, in Milan um, that I might be able to identify such, yes. such figures. Uh, but unfortunately, I, I, I realized that the modern Italian woman there are not too many in the audience, tend, tend to move in groups um, and, uh, and are often of, of good cheer, but, uh, often late at night, singing. Yes. And, um, and, and I, I looked for Stendhalian melancholy, um, but, but never found it, and have, have still not found it. So I must say that I think uh, Italy uh, has changed far more uh, than, than France. One can still recognize many of the accusations that Stendhal makes of France um, and, uh, and, and Switzerland too. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly Switzerland. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, we we haven't mentioned, and I would like to bring them in briefly. The the, the sort of formal attempts at biography that he made, the the, the memoirs of an egotist uh, and the vide of me pour la. Um, and um, he, he, in a way, he, he never quite got that right, did mm. he? I mean, the, it's full of fascinating writing, but mm. but there's something about the. The formal sort of full dress uh, um, self-portrait, which isn't quite Stendhal, mm. um, he's a bit too me me mercurial, a bit too elusive. Yes, I mean, um, one yes. of Stendhal's favourite books was Tristram Shandy, and his autobi autobiographical writing <coughs> definitely has that Shandy-esque quality. He says that he's going to tell you something, and then never gets round to it. Um, and what happens is that he zeroes in on details. Um, it can be romantic details, or it can be a memory of his mother. Um, you know, he will, I mean, he's in this sense quite like Proust, who also doesn't advance very fast, um, but he's not as successful as Proust. I think you're right that the autobiographic writing you know, is not a fully achieved masterpiece, but it's nevertheless very, very interesting. Um, but he somehow, as you say, doesn't quite get the balance right between sort of forward movement and the analysis. And sometimes the thing he he's telling you are, is really quite boring. Um, so he'll zero in on, you know, a line of trees that he saw in the distance, and as he saw the line of trees, he was thinking about, you know, this woman Mathilde, <coughs> and um, you know, it, it get it can be a little bit obsessive. Um, that obsession, when it's working well, is delightful, and again, rather like Proust. I mean, Proust was also an obsessive writer, and there are many passages, particularly in. Albertine Disparu that are frankly very boring because the obsession has just yeah. gone, yeah. has overpowered yes. the writer. Um, and uh, but you know that, that's a sign of good things, though, though, yes. though one slightly suffers in those passages. So if if we are recommending someone for people to start with Stendhal, does it have to be on map? Um, I think it does. I think I do recommend that book. And, um, and I mean, in, in English, uh, um, we're very badly served with, with Stendhal's non-fiction in English. Um, I mean, On Love is, is nicely translated in a Penguin Classics edition, which is, which is, I think, is definitely the place to start. I mean, this is a book. I've given this book to so many people. In my earlier dating days, I would, it would be a perfect gift to arrive at 
dinner with. Uh, nowadays, the life of Henri Brulard, um, and this is translated by John Sturrock, um, the New York Review of Books puts this out, a little bit hard to get. Um, but other than that, I mean, his travel writing is largely unavailable uh, in, in English. Um, his essays on Mozart and... Um, I can, I can find yep, I mean, they're all widely available yes, in French. Yes. Um, it's one of those, yeah, I mean, he's, he's much, much better served in, in France, so we need um, cultural support from the Institut. What I like in Stendhal is that tension between himself and the artifice. And I think, for some reason, for me, the novelistic artifice um, militates against some of what I enjoy, some of the sincerity I enjoy. He, he, he was a, a bit split, and we all are a bit split in the sense that None well, of us of is able to give form to all the emotions we feel. But my goodness, he does a lot more with his emotions than most of us. I mean, you know, this sort of stuff. So he's, you know, he's, he's getting them out there. But you're right that, he, you know, he stands back from them. And sometimes, I mean, he dis uh, um, his, his French is peppered with English. But at certain moments, he, start, he shifts to English. And of course, the moments at which he shifts to English are the most intense. Um, he'll sometimes, he'll suddenly sort of come out with an English phrase or, you know, you know, he'll suddenly say, um, my heart was broken, um, or, or something, and he'll put it in English as a further distancing mechanism. Um, but but it, doesn't, it doesn't feel like, like denial. If he was an author in denial, he would be very boring to write, uh, to, to read. He's, he's, he's an, an author who's overwhelmed by emotion, and that's what makes him very interesting. He's unsuccessful in love is, is, is foreshortening the issue, because clearly he, he felt love often, etc., and... Um, you know, some people might wish to to say that he, you know, he he knew love far better than people who've, you know, in a in a sort of friendly but rather tepid marriage and with five children, and you know, which would have been perhaps an alternative for him. So by by, by standing outside of bourgeois society, outside of marriage, you know, he never married, um, felt ambivalent about marriage, etc. Nevertheless, he was able to stay close to one of the things uh, that we. Um, understand by love, which is his unrequited variety. But I mean, I, I, you know, I'm sure we all know this, but it's, wor it's worth saying that what he describes as love is merely one of its many varieties. So he places at the center unrequited love, a kind of amour passion, he calls it. Um, but there are other kinds of love, you know, the love for children, the love in a marriage after 40 years, etc. There are other kinds of love, and Sandal is not our guide to those at all. So in that sense, Stendhal's book on love is, is probably always going to appeal most uh, to younger people um, or people who will at least be drawn by the book towards emotions of youth because it's particularly um, at, you know, in late adolescence that we're very prone to the sort of feelings that Stendhal is, is describing. It doesn't mean that those emotions are adolescent in a pejorative sense, but just that's the time when most of us experience the most intensely. Do you think it's better to read him when you're in the throes of the kind of um, thwarted passion that he described, or in retrospect? Or does he read differently um, in the midst of things, and, yeah. and looking back in, 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 uh, in wisdom of, of, with hindsight? No, I think he's perfect, but, the perfect person to read at the height of an emotional crisis. Um, when you know you're wondering why she hasn't called, or what did she mean by that, or why is he not answering, etc. You know that's the moment to turn to Stendhal at these moments of, of frustration, because we're all obsessive. We we will all recognise our own obsessiveness in Stendhal's own obsession. You know it's it's at those moments that you get the diary out and you know list you know the 16 times that he might have called or didn't call, or you know the glances she may or may not have given. We all become sort of detectives, we become slightly insane, and, um, and Stendhal gives shape to that insanity, a very appealing shape. There are many kinds of love. Um, it's, he didn't confuse love, he merely identified one sort of love, um, but there are many others, and he will, along with other writers, always be you know, the supreme guide to a, a vision of love. But there are others, you know, if you want another sort of love, go to Eric Fromm. Uh, you know, if you want another sort of love, go to, I don't know. So there's, there's, there's different writers who, who, so I wouldn't say he mistook love for something else, because I don't believe in a monotheistic vision of love. You know, it's a plural emotion. He's very good on a certain kind of love. Of course, you're absolutely right. It's not everything by any means. The life of Henri Boulat is full of drawings, illustrations, maps. Um, 
they're very little commented on. I've read dozens and dozens of books of commentary on Stendhal, and I've never read one that really focuses on this aspect. And yet, to me, and I think your question is really interesting, it's absolutely key um, to a lot of what he's doing. I mean, he can't, he can't go for three pages without the need to introduce a drawing. So what's going on here? Um, and, and as you say, is there something here that's genre-breaking, etc.? I think the origin of these drawings is an attempt to be forensic. It's an extension of that desire which we've already seen to make lists. You know, once you've made a few lists, what next? Okay, why not introduce a picture? You know, if he lived in the age of the camera, I don't doubt that he would have included photographs of the bench on which he sat, um, you know, exactly charting. I think a, 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 an artist and photographer like Sophie Cal, uh, another great French uh, spirit in, 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 that one can mention in this context, is, is, is in a way a kind of descendant of this aspect of Stendhal, the desire to pin down and, um, and, and, and kind of uh, label with the use of, of, of pictures. Um, and they have a, a terrifically emotional effect. You know, when you see the drawing of, um, you know, um, where his mother's bedroom was next to his in his childhood home, and he draws, sketches the house of his childhood home. At one level, this is an architectural plan. At another level, it's a tragedy. You know, it's, it's, it's a, a man remembering, um, you know, the very space in which the greatest loss in his life occurred. So there's, there's often behind these drawings terrific uh, tension. Um, and I think that, uh, I mean, again, I learned, copied shamelessly from that aspect of Stendhal. And um, he gave me the idea, in most of my books, I put pictures and um, drawings and diagrams. So I can think of no better resistance than to, to, to spend Valentine's Day reading uh, Stendhal uh, on love um, and possibly go to Switzerland for all the excitement there. So thank you, Alan, very much indeed. Thank you very much.